When one thinks of the most important historical figures in the field of economics, people who revolutionized things like banking and commerce, names like Adam Smith, Karl Marx, and John Maynard Keynes come to mind. What often doesn't come to mind are men wearing sackcloths and taking a vow of poverty. And yet, it is the Franciscans of the 15th century that lay claim to one of the most important and fascinating developments in economics, bridging the gap between the medieval and modern worlds. What did they do, and why is it still significant today? This is Catholicism in Focus. In the Middle Ages, no force in the church was stronger than the ragtag bunch of poor men called the Franciscans. Known for taking evangelical poverty to its extreme, these were not only unlikely men to start an economic revolution, one wonders how it was even possible. St. Francis of Assisi didn't just forbid the friars from owning or investing money, they weren't even allowed to touch it. What he did allow, however, was the use of what is called a spiritual friend. Looking out into the world and seeing the needs of the poor, wanting to act charitably, the friars were not allowed to collect and give out their own money, but they could introduce rich people to the poor and ask them to pay for their needs directly. And for over a century, this is precisely what the brothers did. They would beg among the rich, asking them to donate money directly to the destitute, and it worked from time to time. Had it not been for the friars and their spiritual friends, many people would have outright died of starvation. But this was by no means the most efficient way to use money or to help the poor. For one, it was difficult to find donors in the case of emergencies, and it precluded the wealthy from giving indiscriminate donations. What if someone wanted to donate money for use in the future? There was no way for the friars to handle this. That was until 1463, when the friars decided to get creative and run hard and fast with church law, you know, like we do. It began with the preaching of one friar, Michel de Carcano de Milano, who believed that the Jewish people had an unjust monopoly on money lending. There was no reason that Christians couldn't engage in this type of business. The powers that be agreed, and in April of 1462, the law was abolished, opening the door for the friars to open their first Monte Pietatis, a benevolent lending institution. First founded in Perugia by brothers Barnabas of Terni and Fortunatus Capoli, the concept was simple. Rich people would donate money to a central business. Poor people could come to take out a loan, but to do so, they needed to leave collateral for the amount they borrowed. When they wanted their possessions back, they returned with the money they borrowed, along with a small amount of interest. In other words, Franciscans invented pawn shops. Eventually, the friars ended up getting around to actually asking for papal approval, because, you know, as they say, sometimes it's better to ask for forgiveness than permission, and the floodgates were finally opened. Between 1462 and 1515, 66 friars founded Montes throughout Italy, ultimately reaching almost every country in Europe. And yet, had it not been for the work of one friar, they may not have succeeded at all. Blessed Bernardine of Feltre, known in his time as the St. Paul of Montes Pietatis, founded an uncountable number of locations and was a chief defender of its most controversial feature, charging interest. Although it may seem normal to most people today, charging interest was simply not allowed in the Middle Ages. To make money off of simply having money, not working, was not only seen to be immoral, it was considered usury, and thus strictly forbidden by the church. But it was precisely because of the problem of usury that the Franciscans founded these institutions in the first place. At the time, the only people lending money to the poor were Jewish or Lombard businesses, each of which charged astronomically high interest rates. Much like title loan places today, the poor took out loans with them as a last resort, but often ended up worse off because of it. Some of the friars didn't like the idea of charging interest, and so the issue was presented at the general chapter of 1493. Bernadine agreed that it would be ideal to lend gratis, but his experience showed that the business would not last long if they did. Without any financial incentive, workers were known to neglect their duties, and borrowers were more likely to keep the money as long as they pleased or to treat the business as a storage facility. They could drop off their winter clothing in summer, pick it up in the fall assured that it would be in good condition, and receive an interest-free loan on top of it. The chapter ultimately decided that it was in the best interest of the poor to charge a small fee, and everyone lived happily ever— Yeah, I'm not even going to finish that setup. It was a disaster for the Franciscans in the church. The Dominicans, known for being extremely articulate and well-educated, 
but completely devoid of creativity or sense of humor, attacked us rabidly. Books were written against us. Inquisitors tried to declare us heretics. They did not like this idea. For them, the outcome of our work didn't matter because the means were flawed. If we charge interest, no matter how little, it was usurious. Cajet and Thomas de Vio argued that because the fee was determined by the size and length of the loan, rather than a flat fee, it constituted money earned not by work, but by usury. It took no more effort on our part to lend $100 than it did to lend $10. It was a legitimate argument, and so the Franciscans responded appropriately by calling the Dominicans heretics and claiming that they were receiving bribes from the Jews. A classic, I know you are, but what am I argument, and things got bitter fast. Luckily, the magisterium got involved to settle this issue and ultimately came down on the side of the Franciscans. At the Fifth Lateran Council of 1515, Pope Leo X issued the papal bull Inter Multiplices, allowing interest to be charged in such institutions and declaring anyone who objected to be excommunicated. Although still a bit scandalous to some, the logic was clear. If someone lends money to another, but has to hire someone to travel to deliver the funds, the lender has a right to charge for the worker's wage. No one is bound to lend at a loss to himself. The same principle applies to running a business as a whole. One must pay employees, keep facilities in working order, cover losses for unpaid debts, and account for taking a risk. It is not usurious to charge a modest amount to keep the business afloat. And with that logic on the books, it was nothing but expansion from there for the Montes Pietates. In 1555, Pope Julius III gave friars permission to receive not only donations, but also investments, meaning that they could charge 5% interest to pay dividends to investors. And in 1617, the bishops of Belgium increased this limit to 10%. Pope Sixtus V eventually allowed the friars to charge interest strictly for the purpose of making a profit for further investment, and by the 18th century, the lid was completely blown. Laymen were given permission to start their own versions of this business, effectively opening it up to all of Christendom. The modern bank had been formed, meaning that at that point, morally lending money to the poor was no longer a Franciscan business. The friars, by no means what you'd expect from an economist, probably having no business in the world of money anyway, rode off into the sunset, having fundamentally changed the landscape of economics. And I'm not just saying that. We truly did. For one thing, benevolent loans like these pumped money into the economy and effectively stamped out usury in Europe. The 16th century saw unprecedented prosperity, in large part due to the near universal drop in interest rates. Some suggest that this was due to the influx of precious metals from the New World, and that certainly helped, but without low interest rates, economic gains would have remained isolated among the rich and would have receded quickly. Proof of this can be seen in the fact that in places where the friars didn't lend money, places like England and the United States, interest rates remained high into the 20th century. With no check on usury, interest rates ranged from 24 up to 1,000% as late as 1898. Because of the Montes Pietatis, capital was put into the hands of young artisans. Citizens were free from selling their wares to foreign businesses below price. Wealthy people were given an opportunity to invest their money, reinserting it into the economy, and public money was put to the benefit of all. Literally, none of this was happening before the Franciscans opened their first pawn shops. But maybe even more significant than that, what the friars ultimately did was vault the church and economy into the modern world. In finding a way to charge interest in a moral way, we effectively reformed the church's understanding of usury and shifted the world from an economy based on money to an economy based on capital. And it just makes you wonder. Without a ragtag bunch of poor men, concerned only with the lives of the poor, where would the world be today? And what might we, as people still concerned with the lives of the poor, do to further the economy next? Music